they're sussing out the, the depth of each other's love and figuring out if they're both willing to jump off the cliff. Romeo and Juliet was due to be performed in the Olivier Theatre in summer 2020. The sets were underway and we were ready to go. And then the pandemic hit. The production, of course, like every other production in the world, was cancelled. And yet, through David Sable, the producer, and Rufus Norris, the artistic director of the National Theatre, their vision, their tenacity said, hey, hang on, what about coming together and trying still to preserve something from that production? We know we can't do a play. We know we can't do an NT Live of recording that play in front of a live audience. What about trying to make a film of the play? It offered up in this instance an opportunity to try and innovate, to try and still create work of scale, work that can reach great audiences and work that celebrates the craft and talent of this building. And I think is trying to push boundaries. Instead of just saying that's not possible, they said, well, what is possible? And came up with this beautiful hybrid idea of allowing an abandoned theatre which is full of memories and past performances, how that theatre can actually become a character who makes the story come to life in this group of actors. So it's almost like the building is allowing the story to be told. It's too cold for me. <laughs> come, shall we go? Can I go forward when my heart is here? Turn back, dull earth, and find thy center out. I was blessed with having a four-week rehearsal period, which for a play is short, but for a film, I hear, I've never done one before, is very long. And those four weeks were a really golden opportunity for me to essentially learn how to direct a film, only having directed plays all my life. We had the cinematographer with us from day one, so it was unlike any other film kind of thing or even a theatre thing where we were all sharing ideas all the time. And so film references and pictures and paintings and music. So there was lots of things in the pot. How it's worked in reality has been magic. It's just kind of like film crew and theatre crew and actors and dancers. We've all been working out at the same time together. On a film, you normally sort of have to turn up and a bit like a sort of dog bringing in a bird. <laughs> Go, here's my performance, I hope it's all right. I think that's really rich and provides really like interesting, original, true and honest moments that I've seen and been a part of. The camera doesn't come at the end of the process, it comes at the beginning. Every morning, Tim Seidel, our great director of photography, would come in and essentially put me through film school. So we talk each morning about this is a close-up, this is a long shot, this is a medium close-up, because really I started the process knowing nothing. And sometimes knowing nothing is quite liberating because you don't know the rules to follow or indeed to break. You just let the story take over. And the film itself, in a way, mirrors the journey from theatre to film because we start, as it were, in a rehearsal. We start on this stage just with the actors wearing simple everyday clothes, simple everyday props. The space is very much like this. And then as the story gains momentum and the imagination of the actors takes over, we move from a very rough theatre context into a much more refined cinematic landscape. We're used to in theatre a single candle representing thousands or a small bit of music telling us that we're in Egypt, whereas in a film we'd have some establishing shots of the Nile. And so this conceptually takes that idea and tussles with it. I think everyone was aware of trying to find a way to capture the experience of theatre in a way that is trying to engage the viewer in the same act of imagination as they experience when they come to the theatre, but when viewing a film. If this was just a film with no rehearsals, I would never have met you. No. I'd never work with you. So the fact that we have that rehearsals allows us to check in with each other and see the people who occupy the world that we're about to create. It's how it bonds the company. It's made me feel much more part of the whole creation of the piece rather than a small cog in a massive machine, I feel like we're all working together to create this thing. In the rehearsal room, we're giving it loads of energy. Yeah, and like trying to fill like a huge theatre-sized space, and then suddenly it's and then like, as soon as Tim is there, like, here, in here, please. Like, keep still, yeah. please. 
The challenge, if I can call it that, is realizing that actually it, the run is in the takes. We get that go at it and that is it. So it's removing a sense of continuity, perhaps, that you get when you're doing the run of a play and really just enjoying the moment and enjoying the relationships as we have them now, as they are. Take thou this vial, being then in bed, and this distilling liquor drink thou off, when presently, through all thy veins, shall run a cold and drowsy humour, for no pulse shall keep his native progress but surcease. And in this borrowed likeness of shrunk death, thou shalt continue two and twenty hours, and then awake as from a pleasant sleep. The adaptation is significantly cut down from the original text, so it's fast-paced, it's distilled to the sort of essentials, I think, of the story, and I hope that will work on screen in a really wonderful way. One of the benefits of taking on such a well-known title is that it's been done thousands of times before and will be done thousands of times again. And so there isn't the pressure of, say, a new play to try and represent the writer's intentions as sacrosanctly as possible because Romeo and Juliet will survive whatever I do to it. So that's strangely liberating. Shakespeare asks you for nothing. He's quite happy to give you everything in the text. So you can choose to do Shakespeare with nothing at all. Once you decide to do it with something, you kind of need everything. So a kind of all or nothing type of writing. And what we've tried to do is something slightly in between, start with kind of nothing and go to all. I wanted to still design things that if we were to open that shutter and present them in some kind of strange, deconstructed theatre film set way, they would sit in that space well. And it's definitely been an opportunity to experience a new way of working. I've been doing it for 25 years. But with that also can come a little bit of autopilot and there's been nothing autopilot about this in any way, shape or form. The theatre techniques are quite different for our makeup between theatre and film. So it's been adapting our skills and our expertise to a different medium, which is the camera, which is the close-up, which is the hyper-realism that sometimes in theatre we bypass. I haven't had to focus particularly on voice in terms of can they speak loudly enough in this production, so the focus has been very much on text. We want it to be really, really modern, really conversational, and it can be. Shakespeare allows that to happen. And for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. I'll take thee at thy word. Call me but love, and I'll be new baptized. Henceforth, I never will be Romeo. What man art thou? By a name, I know not how to tell thee who I am. Are thou not Romeo and a Montague? Neither, fair maid, if either thee dislike. How came so hither? Tell me, and wherefore? This place is death, considering who thou art. If any of my kinsmen find thee here... With love's light wings did I o'erperch these walls, for stony limits cannot hold love out. And what love can do that dares love attempt, therefore thy kinsmen are no stop to me. If they do see thee, they will murder thee. What we've all learnt so much over the last particularly four years is that the root of division and the root of partisanship is sown slowly and in many ways insidiously through a lack of communication. That it's not so much about two groups who self-identify and feud, but about how action motivated by hatred punishes the hater just as much as it does the hated. It's, uh, I suppose, a reminder of the excitement and the joy and the danger of first risking yourself for the love and the affection of, of another. We're still all trying to work out what love means or trying to find ways of articulating what love means and how complex love is and how sort of intoxicating it can be. Nobody wants them to be together. The whole world is against them being together, but they still fight till the, till the end so that they can have a life with love instead of hate. Theatres are all about community, of course. They're all about gatherings. They're all about the one thing that we can't do right now, which is to be together in a group. So of course it's eerie, of course it's poignant, of course it's filled with ghosts. And yet, like any sacred space, it's also filled with promise. It's also filled with the extraordinary gestures, uh, laughter, tears, passion that have filled the space where I'm sitting for decades and decades and decades. So actually sitting here now, working in this space, filming in this space, 
has been an enormous act of hope and of celebration of what has come and what will come. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers. Thank you.